So when someone says education quality is bad because teachers aren't teaching, you don't want to say, okay, teachers aren't teaching. You want to say, well, why aren't they teaching? Mm -hmm. Oh, because they're not being monitored. Well, why are they not being monitored? Mm -hmm. Oh, because the politicians don't care. Well, why do the politicians not care? Because mm -hmm. people don't care. Why do people not care? Mm -hmm. and, in fact, is it true that people not care? Maybe yeah. they do, but they simply don't exercise their political rights yes. through the system. So, you know, you get a very different process. For us, it's really important that you spend time getting the diagnosis done, because guess what? If you don't do the diagnosis right, your solution, which is step three for us, the design, yeah. will solve the wrong thing. It'll be the Band-Aid. Yeah. It won't be the correcting the internal trauma if that's what you're doing. So it won't be a sustainable solution. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are at the Harvard Kennedy School in the beautiful Cambridge in Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about economic development and empowerment. We have awesome Quadra joining us on the show, hello. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on, greatly appreciate it's it. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, Awesome's work so interesting. He's the Professor of International Finance and Development at Harvard Kennedy School. He's the co-director of Evidence for Policy Design, EPOD, and co-founder of the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan, SERP. Starting July 1st, 2019, he will serve as a director of the Center for International Development, CID, at Harvard University. All right, Awesome, let's start things off with the perspective of we're stewards of Earth now. What is your current take on the state of our world? Ah, start with the easy question, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so I guess there, there are two ways to look at it. One way is um, kind of more the arc of history, if you will. Uh, and if you look at the arc of history in terms of, particularly if you take the view of economic development, actually things are really good. Um, in terms of things like education levels, maternal mortality, health outcomes, um, kind of what you would think as the basic ingredients, you know, are people able to consume the basic stuff? What is poverty rates looking like? Like all these simple measures, but powerful measures of economic development and empowerment, actually things are, the, the progress we've made in the last 50 to 100 years has been just spectacular. So in that sense, you know, um, you know things are great. Um, that said, obviously, a lot of us don't feel that way. Uh, and so it would be kind of naive to say, well, look at the data. Clearly, we're much better than our forefathers were. Uh, and so we should all be really grateful and thankful about that. Um, in reality, as you can see in the world, uh, there's a really concerning trend that people are un unhappy, right? The kind of promise of globalization hasn't quite um, given people what they expected. There was resentment. There's polarization, there's increased xenophobia. We aren't a great kumbaya place. We aren't a place where everyone is like thrilled with how they're doing, everyone's opening up to others. Uh, increasingly, if anything, populism is on the rise. Uh, we don't want people to come in from outside. We don't want to share what resources we have. And a lot of people are very dissatisfied. They see their forefathers not in terms of I'm better than what my father had. I have a flat screen TV now. I can eat comfortably now. But they see themselves relative to where they could be or where they think they could be in terms of ranks. And that creates a lot of uh, unhappiness. And so, uh, so I, th I think if you ask me kind of what the pressing problem of our time is, is to really pay creed to that sentiment, is to take it seriously, to not dismiss it, and try and figure out how is it that despite the economic progress we've made, um, these forces are still there? Are they real or are they also driven just by a greater uh, global awareness? Are we just more sensitive to these things now? Uh, and even if it's all in our mind, it still is real, right? Uh, emotions are real, emotions are palatable, beliefs are real, aspirations are real, expectations are real, and divergence from your expectations or aspirations is real because it leads to real behavior. Um, and some of that behavior is not the behavior we as humankind would aspire to. We want to be a place where we provide opportunities for others. We're not unhappy with other success. We want to share another success. We want to help people who are worse off than us uh, become better. And that's the world we aspire to. And so in that sense, I think that to me would be kind of a, a pressing problem. Now, as, as an academic, as a researcher, as also a practitioner, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't get discouraged. It's not, you know, yeah, these are, these are challenging questions, but I, I do think increasingly we have the tools, the information. I mean, we live in an amazing era of, uh, you know, if you gave me access to your phone, I probably know more about your life than you do. Uh, uh, scary as well, but it also says that there's a possibility that we have more, we know now more about the human condition than we've ever done before. Now it's the onus is on us to use that in a way to improve our lives. And when I say our, I don't mean our personal lives, but I mean our collective lives. Yeah, the, the state of the world being so, 
so successful in so many ways of measurement while simultaneously seeing so many things that are like, why do we have those errors happening and how do we fix them? And uh, one of the solutions that you name there is this interdependence on one another and building systems that really uplift the collective, meet basic physiological needs, make the self-actualization transcendence even more uh, commonplace so that we can reap the creative fruits of, of all people. Now, awesome. Now, teach us about the journey that you went through in order to be able to get to this point. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I guess we all have, you know, we all have our personal journeys, and I think a lot of us, we do what we do partly because of that personal journey. Um, and it's very true for me as well. And so for, my, for me, the personal journey was, so, so just so you know, um, I, um, I was born in England. Uh, my parents were doctors. They were originally from Pakistan. They were working in England. Uh, I spent my childhood in Nigeria. Uh, my parents had a drive to be in the world. Um, they decided they were going to work in Nigeria. So I spent all my childhood, actually amazing years, in Nigeria, in northern Nigeria, in a place called Kano. Um, as an adolescent, I moved to Pakistan. So I did kind of my, I would say, my sort of middle to high school education in Pakistan. Again, sort of an amazing experience, challenging times, but an amazing experience. Um, and then I, I came as an undergrad to actually Cambridge, um, not Harvard, a place down the road, which Harvard makes fun of called MIT, but I love both places. Um, and I never left. Uh, I did my PhD at Harvard, um, and I joined the faculty here. Uh, How so. did the transition happen from Pakistan to Cambridge? How did you find that? Yeah, it's a great, um, so you know, so the one thing that has worked for me, and I'll, I'll say a couple of things, and some might sound contradictory, so, but I'll explain why they're not. So. One of the things I valued and I got from my parents very much, and it's part of their journey as well, and it's part of my family's journey and my personal journey, is uh, investing in human capital. It was always about that. The way you would kind of move to the next stage in life was you really invested in education. And for me, kind of applying to the US, uh, there were good places in Pakistan as well, but nothing compared to the kind of places you could get here. And so it was all about trying to do the best you can in that educational journey, and sometimes at great personal cost. I mean, all my siblings, I have two other brothers, all of us did that. And you know, my parents, I, I sometimes feel, you know, the best gift they could have given us was a very costly gift for them. It was a gift of education and human capital, but it also meant a gift of mobility. You know, my parents stayed back, all their kids are spread out in the world. Uh, and you know, I, I give them a lot of credit to say that, look, I'm not gonna hold them back to me. You know, there's an insecurity, you want your kids to be with you. But you know, you, if you invest in people, guess what happens, they move. Um, and so for me, it was very clear that human capital was very important. The other two lessons I learned, and again, I credit a lot my parents and my grandparents uh, for this as well, is kind of two realizations. The first is even though hard work matters and education matters, most of what success is determined by is just luck. Yeah. I was just lucky. I was lucky to be born in a family which was reasonably well off. My parents were doctors, my grandparents were professionals. You know, so there was in a country where you know, the vast majority of people can barely, at least in those times, had barely enough food to survive. I had the luxury of being able to invest in human capital. And that was just luck. Uh, and also just their attitude. Right. Um, the friends I found in life who guided me, the mentors I found, a lot of these things, you can ex post look at them and say, no, 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 but there was some strategy here. I really think maybe, but mostly it was just I was there at the right place at the right time. I was born in the right place. And the reason I kind of mention this is, I'm not saying hard work doesn't matter, but the majority of what describes a variation in your outcomes is luck. And then once you land in some place, of course you can have a positive trajectory based on your investment in human capital. But because you realize it's luck, then the third lesson is very obvious, which again comes to me from my parents. My parents were doctors, and I remember as a child I would really begrudge, like the patient always came first, right? We would be going out somewhere, my dad's an ophthalmologist, my mom's a gynecologist, you know, and emergency would come. Mm -hmm. And it was never a question yeah. of saying, kids, sorry, but I gotta do this, mm -hmm. both my mom and my dad. And I, you know, as a child you resent that, but as you grow older, you realize what message they were telling you, yeah. that what matters is not your personal individual happiness, but giving to others. Yeah. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, I vowed never to be a doctor because uh, I was like, man, this, is, yeah. this, this takes over your life. Although in a very ironic way, I've ended up being a different kind of doctor yeah. and <laughs> equally a, a, as obsessed, I would say, in a good way yeah. about making that difference. But I think that, that's really poignant because, or, 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 or is really powerful. Once you recognize that most of life is luck, then you feel like it's your responsibility to have whatever resources you have um, because they're produced by luck. Like what you have is not just, you know, you, you shouldn't feel ownership. Uh, even if you think you got it yourself through your hard work, you should realize most of it was a gift given to you. And if it's a gift given to you, then it's your responsibility to share that gift with others in whatever way you can. And so that's, that's really been a driving force in a lot of the work that I've done and uh, a lot of people that I'm impressed by uh, who, who, who have lived that. If we stand on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely. The 100 billion people that built civilization before us. Absolutely. And also it makes sense now with understanding the journey that you went through, the, a very globalized journey with parents that were both putting others' health uh, first, and that, that makes sense now for me to better understand who you are and hopefully others as well. Awesome, now teach, <coughs> us, teach us about these three, Evidence for Policy Design, EPOD, Center for Economic Research in Pakistan, SERP, and the Center for International Development, CID. One thing here that is a common thread that I've seen is that you are using scientific evidence to show how to best develop economies and maximize people's potential. Absolutely. So, you know, so I, I was trained as an economist. Uh, uh, and so for me, I'm not necessarily making a blanket statement of error, I'm just describing how I found the world really uh, um, a, a way to contribute to the world uh, using my own ability. So I, I was trained initially as an engineer. Uh, so my approach to the world as an undergrad, I was, you know, uh, did math, computer science and economics. Uh, but, you know, I very much had an engineering view of the world. Um, what I like about engineers is, is in some sense, and I don't want to offend engineers who are real engineers, I became an economist, uh, is there's a simplicity in how they approach things, which I think is beautiful. And the simplicity is you start with a problem you face, and you don't necessarily theorize or philosophize about it endlessly. You kind of are, you have, there's a very practicality to it. There's a problem, I gotta fix it, right? And then you realize that you're fixed to the problem. The machine you make to solve the problem isn't perfect. It's never gonna be perfect. That's fine, but you still build the machine. And then what you do is you kind of run the machine and you see how it does. And as you operate the machine, the kind of, you figure out which parts are working, what are not working, and you keep adjusting and iterating. What I find in policy making or economics, if you will, is very similar to that approach. Um, you, you analyze a problem, you then say, okay, I'm gonna try and design a solution to this problem. I'm gonna diagnose, first of all. I'm gonna figure out what's causing this problem. Then I'm gonna try and design a machine, a solution. It'll be a policy reform. Um, now, the role of evidence or analytics is critical in this. Because you can't, while it's important to use human intuition, look, I'm, big, I'm a big believer in the power of the narrative, the power of intuition, uh, the power of personal perspective. But that's the initial driving force. If you only rely on that, you can lead to all sorts of biased decisions. I think this is the right policy because I believe in it. And that's dangerous. Uh, so having that initial inspiration start you off, but then marrying it with analytics, which to me is both theory and data, is critical. Mm -hmm. Because that keeps that machine um, running well. Mm -hmm. It keeps that policy adjustment that you need to do based on real hard evidence. And what, what, often when I say hard evidence, people think, well, you're an economist, you're obviously gonna use like quantitative stuff only. But increasingly, and that is a weakness, by, <laughs> by the way, I acknowledge that. But increasingly, we're able to use qualitative analysis as well. So for me, the framework is not about, I'm running a regression or doing some really big data type of stuff. It's just that I'm being analytical, logical, consistent in how I'm adapting, iterating, and improving my policy. And I think that becomes fundamental. The three organizations you mentioned all sort of typify all uh, exactly that approach. Um, uh, let me start with EPOD and SERP, uh, because they're both kind of sister organizations. EPOD at a more global scale, SERP at a country specific scale. Mm -hmm. um, SERP really operates in Pakistan, and you should think of EPOD and SERP having the same mission, except SERP's view was, look, a country like Pakistan, it's huge, 200 million people, still doesn't have as much evidence-based decision-making in policy. I mean, the US is amazing in that sense, of developed countries at how much solid scholarship you have about any policy reform you could think of. A lot of countries like Pakistan and other developing countries don't have that. 
And so SERP for us was uh, with a bunch of my colleagues, um, several faculty members who are kind of like me, who are from Pakistan, Atif Mi at Princeton, Ali Chima at Lums in Pakistan, Adnan Khan at LSE in London, uh, Tahir Ndrabi at Pomona. Uh, th- we, a bunch of people got together and we said, we got to build something like this in Pakistan. And that's been a fruit of love. Um, where for the last 10 years or so, we've really pushed both in terms of creating evidence for policy, training policymakers, training future researchers, uh, interfacing with decision makers, the whole gamut. Um, um, and you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that that organization has recently uh, moved to stage two, uh, where the founders, people like us, have stepped back a bit and new leadership is emerging to kind of scale that organization up. Mm-hmm. EPOD is very similar. EPOD uh, was set up by Rohini Pandey and Rima Hanna and myself, kind of three academics who work in different parts of the world. But the same idea, we wanted to have, uh, you know, we're sitting at the Kennedy School, so for me it was really important to say, you know, evidence should be useful. Um, It should be applied. We sit at a policy school, and so we should really try and be at the same, if you will, not just design table, but the problem discovery table as a policymaker. We have amazing people who are students of ours, uh, some younger, some older, who are actually driving policy change in their countries. We need to somehow have a partnership with them where the two of us are in the same table working together towards this journey. And that's just been spectacular. Uh, And I'm really grateful to have been part of that in different countries. If you can look at EPOD's work, and I welcome people to do so online, you'll see kind of some of the examples of how these engagements work. Um, CID is is, uh, the parent of EPOD. Uh, we were all part of CID. I've now had the, um, um, you know, people think it's an honor, but I think of it as a, as a, as a heavy responsibility. Burden, perhaps, is a harsh word to use. I've, I've re- I will be starting as director for CID um, in, in July. And I'm taking over from Ricardo Hausman, who's done an amazing uh, job uh, as, as, a, as a leader for the last, actually, uh, almost decade and a half. Uh, and what I view kind of CID is very much that first thing I said to you, which is, you know, if I think of what one of the biggest assets that I'm sitting on right now, the biggest gifts, if you will, is that I'm at Harvard. Um, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I mean that in a way that Harvard is one of the unique places to me, and whether it deserves it or not is a different question, but which has amazing influence in the world. Um, in fact, it has amazing global convening power. So it's not just Harvard has amazing set of faculty and students, which it does. It's just some of the uh, most impressive people I've met here uh, have, been, have been sort of uh, uh, in, my, in my years over here. But what I find amazing is it is able to draw other talented people into it, even if they visit for a bit, even if I get faculty from other universities that come in and work together. And so, so my vision for CID is really that we should leverage global talent in the world to solve some of the most pressing problems that the world faces today. Mm. It's, it's a very simple vision, but I feel like it's a vision where we increasingly at Harvard are enablers. Um, we're doers as well, some of the work we'll do ourselves, but mostly we enable uh, the best, the most talented people in the world to connect with those who have the most needs and make that work happen in the same framework, in the same analytical, evidence-driven style of work. Uh, and that's what I'm most excited about. Um, whether I'll succeed or not, we've already, I think, achieved somewhat in this, but you know, I'm, I want to keep growing. And so um, you should ask me in a few years how it's going. But that's, that's the intent. Okay, so I want to now learn from you about the, ex- the exact uh, practices of policy design across the world that you have implemented and scientifically analyzed when you uh, when your team gave a talk at uh, Effective Altruism Global in Boston um, we were able to learn that uh, there's a specific way to deliver insecticide treated nets mm. um, for insects uh, from especially mosquitoes in Africa and how it was crazy seeing over 15 years uh, the amount of cases just decrease of malaria and I would love to um, learn about f- deeper uh, these specific yeah, cases and how you've been analyzing Great. So them. let me give you, uh, so the insectivite one is, is probably um, uh, work done by JPEL, which is great, the Poverty mm-hmm. Action Lab at MIT, and they're doing some wonderful work as well. Um, 
this, uh, let me answer this in, in kind of uh, both the micro of it and the macro of it. Uh, the micro is kind of specific examples of projects. Um, projects I've been involved in and projects colleagues of mine have been involved in. And so I'll give you three examples uh, of the micro and then I want to kind of take it to the macro level to say what's, what's the template over here? What's, mm -hmm. wh how do we get to scale this up so that it's not just us doing it but many others can do it as well. At the micro level, I'll start first with my own work because I know it better. So just one example of my work is I've been doing work in education now in, in Pakistan for the last almost two decades. Um, and in that work, we started very much um, with what I would call a um, input-based approach. Like the approach was figure out specific things which are not working, uh, like, uh, you know, um, do schools lack good teachers or do schools lack good textbooks? Or, and that's very much what the literature has done. And then, and this is the revolution, the empirical revolution that uh, people like Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee and Michael Kramer and others spearheaded, um, which is kind of randomized control trials. Be very scientific about what you're doing, test these inputs, see what happens when you randomly allocate these inputs to one group and not the other, just like you did in medical drug trials. Mm -hmm. And there's been a profound set of knowledge that has been created uh, from that. That's very much the approach that we started with. But increasingly we have, uh, um, at least in my work, I've changed slightly in the sense that rather than, my concern with, with inputs is that what if you don't get it right, right? What if you don't know in this environment what's the right input? And you could, you could try different ones and navigate that way and that's one way to go. The way we went is mostly maybe because of my own background which is I, I'm an industrial organization person as well. And so, so I, I viewed schools and parents and teachers as very interesting actors. And so one of the views I took is to say, well, if the actors are there, and a lot of the times I saw in Pakistan, the actors were there. Parents did want schooling for their kids. Kids did want to improve. Teachers, um, as long as they were rewarded appropriately, did want to teach better. Um, uh, schools did want to provide good quality education, as long as, again, they're rewarded and recognized for it. And so a lot of the work that I've done now uh, together with uh, Jishnu Das who's at the World Bank and Tahir and Rabi who's at Pomona under the name of LEAPS, uh, Learning and Achievement in Pakistan Schools, is understanding what are the frictions that prevent these actors from s achieving success. So every one of our projects now has really resolved one or the other of these frictions. It could be informational frictions. I as a parent don't know what schools are good or bad. It could be financial frictions. I as a school can't get money to grow. It could be labor market frictions. I, as a school, can't hire good teachers or reward them. Um, it could be um, educational intermediary frictions. I, as a school or as a parent, can't buy educational support services like extra coaching or teacher training uh, or e-learning. And so I like we how have, you use the word frictions. Exactly. Yes. It's, it's exactly that. And so that approach, uh, Touchwood, has been working really well. And now we're scaling it up to kind of do it at the economy-wide level. So almost think, create a virtual marketplace, create a virtual market, just like it's Amazon meets eBay, uh, where you know parents and teachers and schools and financial providers and uh, educational support service providers can all meet together and kind of exchange. And so mm -hmm. that's been one approach. Let me mention briefly two other projects, not of mine, but I think I, 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 I think these are amazing. And just quick, just to make sure it's clear, th so then th these uh, these key players will meet and talk about their best practices for decreasing friction, and then they'll apply those. Exactly. Okay. Um, so they will, because they they we're enabling them to act basically. Um, and as long as this, the nice thing about this approach is that as long as their preferences are in the right way, they will achieve success. Test scores will go up, school fees will drop, education quality will improve. And every one of our projects, we see that happening, right? Um, uh, so, cool. so I'm not saying, look, sometimes it is the case that preferences may not be progressive. Parents may not want to educate girls. You know, there are situations like that where this approach would need more nudging. But by and large, I've seen uh, most actors do want the best for their kids. Uh, parents do, teachers do. And so, so um, I think as a first pass, there's a lot of room to be made of improvement just by enabling actors. Yeah, yeah, um, cool. um, uh, I want to mention uh, Rohini Pandey and Reema Hanna's work, which is both is just spectacular. Uh, Rohini has been doing some amazing work in India on environmental regulation. And a very similar s spirit to this work, uh, trying to think about, and that's just one example, trying to think about how do I work with regulators and environmental agencies to have a uh, a much more systematic design-based process through which they can improve regulation. And her work has found huge impact just by doing simple design tweaks. Well, not that simple, but you know, reasonably feasible design tweaks, finding amazing work. 
Similarly, uh, Rima Hanna with uh, co-authors of hers at MIT, Ben Olkin and Abhijit Banerjee, have done some spectacular work, a series of papers on improving targeting of subsidies in, in Indonesia. So again, how do we use yeah. evidence and design to better target subsidies that a country may be giving its poor people? There's a whole bunch of papers, I'm not gonna summarize them, but all of this work, and let me now go to the macro point, mm -hmm. Each of this kind of work typifies one specific style of working. Uh, and we've kind of codified that in what we at EPOD call SPEEDY, Smart Policy Design and Implementation. Uh, and this is just one manifestation of this work. I'm not necessarily saying, well, this is the only way to go, but it, uh, let me explain it to you because it'll highlight how we're able to be consistent and how evidence and analytics can be brought in. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do in SPEEDY is we kind of have the, the following steps. So first, we want to identify the problem. And this is non-trivial. A lot of times we focus on problems which are not really the problems. Mm -hmm. um, we do kind of superficial problems. So uh, to give you an example in education, my problem is enrollment. Okay, so I, I might ask a minister of education or a secretary of education, why is enrollment your problem? And they might say, well, it's because I want better jobs for my people or I want um, better civicness. And then you say, well, wait a second, is your problem enrollment or is your problem getting the type of education which leads to personal improvement. Mm -hmm. And those are different problems. Mm -hmm. Because the first problem, you just get kids in school. The second problem, you have to make sure that not only do you get kids in school, but they're learning the kind of skills that would help them in life. Yes. So quality comes in, yes. not just enrollment. Yes. So the first step for us is getting the problem right. The second, and by the way, each of these steps is done in tandem with researchers and practitioners and people in the field. It's not like any one of us has the right to decide that. We all collectively uh, have that discussion. You're poking with the question, why? Deeper, why? Exa well, that comes next. Okay, That's exactly okay. right. So once we know the problem, then you want to do a, what we would call in medicine a differential diagnosis. Why is the problem occurring? You keep asking why. And you want to go beyond the kind of superficial diagnosis. If you, if you were a patient and you were bleeding and you walked into a doctor and you said, hey, doctor, what's my problem? The doctor said, well, you're bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're going to laugh exactly what you just did, right? You're going to laugh and say, well, that's, that's it. Uh, and then the doctor says even worse, and by the way, here's some Band-Aids. Yeah. <laughs> I stopped the bleeding, thank you so much. Check, please yeah. leave, right? A good doctor would say, well, wait a second, why are you bleeding? Yes. Is it an external injury? Is it an internal hemorrhage? If it's internal hemorrhage, which organ is hemorrhaging? Yes. Why is it hemorrhaging? So you wanna do the same in policy. So when someone says education quality is bad because teachers aren't teaching, you don't wanna say, okay, teachers aren't teaching. You wanna say, well, why aren't they teaching? Mm -hmm. Oh, because they're not being monitored. Well, why are they not being monitored? Oh, because the politicians don't care. Well, why do the politicians not care? Because mm -hmm. people don't care. Why do people not care? Mm -hmm. In fact, is it true that people not care? Maybe yeah. they do, but they simply don't exercise their political rights yes. through the system. So, you know, you get a very different process. For us, it's really important that you spend time getting the diagnosis done, because guess what? If you don't do the diagnosis right, your solution, which is step three for us, the design, will solve the wrong thing. It'll be the Band-Aid. It won't be the correcting the internal trauma if that's what you're doing. So it won't be a sustainable solution. It might work for a bit. Uh, in fact, you do want to actually, the joke in bleeding is the first thing you want to do is actually stop the bleeding. That is correct, <laughs> yeah, that is but good. you don't stop there, right? Especially if you have a lot of bleeding going on, yeah. you don't want the patient to die from the superficial cause, right? So it could be that you solve that, but there's a deeper analysis. You guys go to the roots. Exactly, the root causes, if you will. And that's step two for us. Step three is design. Now you become the engineer. Now you say, what's the policy machine? What's the thing I need to make to solve this? And to solve not the problem, but the deeper diagnosis mm -hmm. you just did. Mm -hmm. um, step four is even if you can design. Give us a quick idea of what a uh, design, would, design look like. would look like. So, so let me continue the education mm -hmm. example. So suppose I found out that the problem was that there's really political, uh, teachers are not present. Uh, teachers aren't present because there isn't bureaucratic pressure. There isn't bureaucratic pressure because there isn't political pressure. Um, but parents care. Mm -hmm. Then you've said the deeper diagnosis is somehow parents are not being able to express their concern politically through the system. Mm -hmm. So a design would be, and this is something, I mentioned this kind of hypothetically, but it's actually something I'm working with a political scientist, uh, Tiffany Simon, who's a PhD student, uh, used to work with me in Princeton. She and I are proposing this pilot project where in Pakistan, we're gonna to go to households and see if we can get their preferences better politically expressed. Yes. So how do you get people to lobby for something if that's the deeper concern? And I don't know if that's true or not, mm -hmm. but that the design we're gonna do is basically effective ways we're gonna examine for 
parents in rural areas to express their unhappiness with their school in their village yes. to either their local politician or central politician or the local bureaucrat or the central bureaucrat. And, and we're how, do test. They, how do they get engaged? Uh, exactly. So, yes. so, so what we're going to do is to say, what is the right form of engagement? What is the right messaging? So it really is political activism, but in a way that we examine different ways. So for instance, is the right thing for you to do is all get together and have a meeting with the local bureaucrat and explain your concerns? Mm -hmm. Is the right thing for you to do is go talk to the local media and uh -huh. basically say, look at what's going on, come see our school, it's mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a, you, you make the, the politician, the bureaucrat feel guilty. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is it about taking your local um, 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 uh, um, politically active person and they go with you to the politician who says, hey, if you want votes next year, you better fix this problem. Yeah, that's yeah. how democracy works. Yes. Um, which of these means would work? And so that's an example of two or three different ideas. And the way we do it is, and that brings me to the implement yes. stage. You know, the devil really is in the details. You can design something, but I often think we underestimate how much implementation is challenging. And so I gave you three or four examples. What we would do is we would figure out with a local organization, so in this case we are going to work with local NGOs, who know how to implement things and say, in this context, what is the right way to implement this idea? Okay. But we're still not done. Even if you implement, and even if you have the best design, and even if you have the best diagnosis, there's never be arrogant, right? Realize you could be wrong. And so what we do is Especially the last when you're in a culture in of a different part of the planet. Absolutely. Yeah. So for us, the last two stages we call test and refine, which is set up, and this is where randomized control trial uh, techniques or other techniques can come in. Like if I had four or five different ideas, try all of them in a scientific way that you can test their relative effectiveness. It's running the permutations. It's running the permutations, right? It's when the engineer starts running the machine and gets lots of data to see how the machine is running um, in different scenarios. Um, and then the last step, as you run the machine, as you test this, as you test these different policies, new things will emerge. Mm. Some things will succeed, some will not. And so the last step for us is refining. It's a constant iteration where you learn from this first iteration about what worked. What didn't work, you either improve or stop doing. What worked, you do more of, and you get into more nuanced ways of getting it to work. So you would take the different design that, that, you've, that, that are being implemented. You would actually go and work with a couple different schools and a couple different methods. Absolutely. And then you would analyze how successful those exactly. were, and then continue the ones that were successful, maybe refine some of the exactly. ones that weren't, that's, to try and see if they could That's exactly right. Them. And in fact, my wish list for policy is that that's how policy should happen. Mm -hmm. All policy should happen in this way. Now it's challenging because remember, a politician or a leader doesn't want to say, I don't exactly know what to do, but I'll figure it out. That's not a great political slogan. Politicians and leaders say, I know exactly what to do. Vote for me and I'll get your problem solved. I think, so th there's a dichotomy there. And my sense is, look, people want to hear that, I get it. People want to hear, so I think you can be honest while not necessarily getting into the details of things. You can say, I will fix this. But that doesn't mean sticking to a specific policy. I will fix this by adapting, or adopting a procedure or a process which is a self-learning, correcting, iterative process. So even if I start with my best guess, which I think may not be perfect, I can improve every single iteration. I can get better and better and better. So over time, I am doing what I promised to you, which is I am fixing the problem. Right? Uh, but I think we have a tendency of not only saying we're fixing the problem, but also giving the solution at the same time. And then we get stuck. Because yeah. if our solution isn't the right solution, we have one or two choices. Admit that the solution was wrong and change it, or just stick to it. And most of us just stick to it and hope the next guy is going to come up and say, well, it was a perfect solution, but he screwed it up. So I hope that we can get more nuanced in how we do policy. And that's something I would like not only for us at CID, but at the Kennedy School to spread, but also kind of teach amongst our students and practitioners. Welcome this act of saying, set up the right processes, um, become learning states. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to write, a, um, I'm beginning to write a book with a colleague of mine, Adnan, and, and a couple of other colleagues as well, uh, on um, how do we do evidence-based decision-making in the policy space? Yes. And we're going to call it something like learning states. Yeah. But the idea is to really uh, uh, set up this, this kind of learning iterative process. Yes, yes. OK, so now that you've laid out Speedy for us and given us the idea of the evidence And by the way, I should say um, one other yeah, thing. Yeah. I, I wanted to mention two other Please. groups. Yes. Um, building state capabilities, which is at CID. Uh, 
it does an amazing thing called PDIA, Problem Driven Iterative Adaptation, oh, which is cool. very similar to Speedy. Yeah. Same ideas. And then Growth Lab, um, which is headed by Ricardo Hausman, which also has a very interesting diagnostic approach, a more macro approach, but basically says, what's the binding constraints that an economy faces, and how do I alleviate those constraints? So, so I do want to say that a lot of us are overlapping a lot. We may use different terms and yes, words, yes. but I think there's a general agreement that our approach is very analytical, iterative, self-learning, corrective. So that feature yeah, is yeah, not yeah. inherent to Speedy. Yes, yes. Uh, it's shared by all of us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. And it totally makes sense running the permutations, analyzing which ones are doing the best, uh, and continuing to go to different pockets of the world to continue testing these policy designs. Now, I want to know with the Center for International Development, what, what exactly is kind of this future roadmap? Is taking this process that you've described and applying it across more places in the world and empowering people mm -hmm. to get the process in and, and, and applying it? Is that kind of... I think efficient? that's it, yeah. I mean, it's very much taking... It, uh, so two things. One, the approach, and the other, the convening power uh, that we are lucky enough to have over here. So, um, and, you know, if I, if I were to believe in my own process, I should admit that this approach is iterative as well. There's lots of learning in this. So what I'm giving you yes. is my initial thing, but I want to be scientific in how I do policy as well, right? Um, so I'm starting with what my best guess is. My best guess is we have an amazing ability to bring people together. Um, we should use that gift. And the, 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 the responsibility we have is to make sure that matching is happening in the best possible way. So we get the best possible talent whether it's at Harvard or elsewhere. We get the most needy people. When I say needy people, I mean pro people dealing, leaders or citizens dealing with really pressing problems in the world, and we try and put the two together. Okay. So that's that convening aspect. And then once you come together, how do we bring them together? What do we do when we come together? And that's very much this approach, which is, uh, and, and when I say the approach, I mean the meta version of the approach, not the specific, like everyone's going to be doing speedy. I mean, I might personally love that to say, oh, look, speedy is happening everywhere. But it's more the meta of the approach, which is people are willing to be in learning environments. People are willing to set up learning systems. Um, the specifics of how they do it is up to them. We can give some ideas, but I think the idea that I can design something, I can diagnose it properly, I can iterate, I may be wrong, I need to experiment, um, this kind of thinking is critical, right? Failure is not a problem. Like well, We often think of failure as like a terrible, terrible thing. The, the terrible thing is, is ignoring failure when it happens and not learning from it. That's terrible, right? Um, and so just getting people comfortable with that kind of way of thinking. I think that's the meta. So yeah. if I even succeed in a bit of this, and you know, there'll be another leader at CID, all I hope is that that journey. I'm stepping on people's shoulders. I would love it if in a few years, I'm ready to step down and someone else is emerging who's taking this idea to its next level. So then would it be fair to say that you really care a lot about identifying the, act, the key actors within the areas of the world that you want to make, help make policy design uh, um, it, permutations and, and scientific analysis within. You need to find those key actors, put them together, especially from different socioeconomic statuses, different That's backgrounds, right. different uh, some in political office, some in the education office, that type of stuff. Okay, okay. And actually, uh, find requires the onus on me. If this thing works, they come themselves, right? If you succeed in what they're doing, people recognize it. And then people are like, where should I, if I have a really pressing problem and I want to work in this learning uh, iterative way, where do I go? And they'd be like, hey, the CID at the Kennedy School. Yeah. I know they've done it. And so, you know, they start approaching us. And then all you need to do is basically just help match them, right? You don't need to go out and kind of, yeah. um, the best sort of uh, signal that you're working is whether others want to do what you're doing, yes. uh, both in terms of joining you and even replicating what you're doing. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, great. That, that does seem like a really strong way you build out the processes and people reach out and you can pair people together and make the change. This is awesome. I'm so excited for Center for International Developments uh, to, to continue making the impact and also to, for us as a simulation to be able to continue coming and talking to the different um, leaders. You mentioned so many of them throughout oh, yes, the conversation. Absolutely. For us to be able to sit down and dive deep into what's happening in India or Indonesia and the Africa. Africa. There's some Africa. Just, just amazing people. Yeah, yeah, let's get deeper into the exact uh, nuance of, of, the, yeah, of what, how it's actually happening as well. Um, okay, just two quick questions on the way out that we like asking our guests on our show. Uh, do you think we are in a simulation? Is this a simulation? <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. I mean, there's a deep question of is life a simulation? Are we living? A, I used to have a teacher who was teach something called phenomenology, which is everything we experience is an illusion, uh, and there may be multiple illusions that you're experiencing. But for me personally, no. I I think this is very real. I think everything we say, everything we and I, you and I have talked about, from my perspective, is very real, mm -hmm. and it's something I want to commit to acting on, and I hope. You do, and I yes. hope your audience does. And so, yes. but yes, in some grand scheme of things, it could be an elaborate simulation. But yeah, because at the very end of taking action on all of these pressing challenges, you at the very end get to see how many levels you gained, how much you, experience you, you gained. Yeah, so you have to take these challenges on and build up the skills. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the very last question we like asking is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Um, to me. I guess for me the most beautiful thing is when I see someone deploying their talent, whatever that may be, for doing something which goes beyond themselves. Yeah, that's profound. So, yes. I like that a lot. Yeah. And that's in many ways what the processes that you're implementing do enables people to self-actualize and then self-transcend as Absolutely. well. And what I like about that is it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, how rich you are, how poor you are, how talented you are. I f fundamentally believe each one of us has some beautiful thing inside them which they can give. Uh, maybe just a smile, you know? So, yeah. Different colors on color wheels. Some smile, some raise kids, some build the billion dollar organization. As long as you're going beyond yourself. You're going beyond the self. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much it's for coming pleasure. on the show yes. and sitting down with yes. us, teaching I us about all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, um, everyone that watched, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate it. Please check out the links below. We'll have all of the links, evidence for policy design, Center for Economic Research in Pakistan, Center for International Development, and go and talk to more people about these types of processes of economic development around the world. Talk to your friends, your family, online, on social media, with your coworkers. Let's get more people researching this and effectively being able to implement economic development strategies. And also, support the artists, entrepreneurs, and organizations around the world that you believe in. Help them scale simulations. Links are below. Help us out as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. That's it. Awesome. Thank you so That's much. Great. Really appreciate it.